Uh, hello and welcome to the special event. First of all, happy Plant Appreciation Day. I hope everybody has found a moment to be outside or even in the has seen the plants inside your house. So we'll do a quick round of introductions. And before I hand it over to Sandy, who is the president of the Linnaean Society and a senior researcher at the Natural History Museum of London. And as you know, there will be readings, there'll be short presentations by our guests tonight. And first of First, I'll start with Dawn, um, who works at the intersection of fine art and ecology, who will be reading a bit from her book called Beyond Plant Blindness. And thanks to COVID and lockdown, this is actually a launch for your book, Dawn, in a way. Um, next, we have Sven Batke, who's uh, the plant science program leader at Edge Hill University. And he will be talking to us about how to infuse the next generation of plant scientists. We also have Sophie Leguil, whom all of you might already know from Twitter because of pavement plants and more than weeds, um, who has definitely taught me a lot about uh, what the plants are outside my house and next to the park. And then we have Geetanjali Sachdev, who is online pretty late from India. Um, she's an art and design teacher and has been involved in developing frameworks for art and design curriculum for the past 25 years at the Srishti Institute of Art and Design in Bangalore, India. So today, of course, we'll be talking about plant blindness, the term, this definition, how it has come by and what we can do about it. But before we move on to Dawn, I would like to hand it over to Sandy, who of course has lots of things to say about plants, always has things to say about plants. So over to you, Sandy. Thank you, Padma. I mean, I think I think my my co-panelists here probably have a lot more to say about plants that's relevant to today than I do. But I just want to welcome everyone to the Linnaean Society of London um, virtually and hopefully we'll be able to meet in person sometime soon. Um, but if for those of you who don't know, the Linnaean Society is the oldest natural history society devoted to natural history in the world. And we we were founded in 1788 by John Smith to house the collections of Carl Linnaeus, which were bought um, from that great Swedish botanist by, by Smith. And what we do today is far more than just look after the collections. We do that, but we also do a lot of uh, public events, lectures and talks, and we do a lot of event of uh, work with schools. And we also do a lot of things with the community around us in London. And so I'd urge any of you who are not fellows of society to look us up on the web, www.linnaean.org and look at, at becoming a fellow. I know being a fellow has been a great thing for me. It's really brought me a lot of a lot of joy and it's also brought me in contact with a lot of people that I might not have been in contact with in my ivory tower academic life. And that's one of the great things about the society is it brings together academics and people who are not in the academic sphere. So that means that that we can share a lot of ideas and it's really a good place for generating ideas. So with no more ado, I'm going to hand back to Padma for today's event, but I do want to wish everything of ha everyone a happy Plant Appreciation Day, because I think it's really important that we celebrate plants. And this is our society's way of celebrating plants on this special day. So over to you, Padma, to tell us what we're going to do. Okay, so first we'll start with uh, Dawn's presentation and a reading, which includes a reading from her book. Dawn, over to you. Hi everyone, and um, I just I hope that um, two of the uh, co-editors on the book, Brindis Snebjonsdottir and Mark Wilson, are also attending the webinar. So if you have questions for any of us, uh, please put them in the Q and A box. Um, I'm going to start with an influence on how I think about plants and and this interface between ecology and art, and I guess the business biz, biggest artistic influence on uh, my journey um, through my life and particularly now as an academic working with plants. So I'm just going to share my screen uh, and I'm going to ask my colleague um, Sven to help me with the German. I have a friend Katerina who's sent me a voice uh, message today and I tried to practice and it just sounded horribly mangled. Um, and the question that um, we've been asking in the book um, and with the other authors is where can a single plant take you and I think that that's a really good message for today when you 
when you sip your tea or you drink your coffee or eat your cereal or even pull a cotton sheet over you or walk outside and look at weeds in the corner of a pavement where, where can a single plant take you and I think that for me one of the most influential artworks although I've never actually seen it it's a small watercolor I hope to one day Sven uh, das große Rasenstück Thanks. And in English, The Great Piece of Turf. It's a small watercolour by Albrecht Dürer. And um, many commentators have said that this brings you face to face with some very ordinary plants. But the detail, the observation, the, um, the quality of the singularity of the occasion, I think is something that's influenced me thinking about working with artists and scientists and was a deep influence in in developing the research project, a part of which is the book, and most definitely is the artworks by Brindis and Mark. And I wanted to show you one spectacular example of the work that they created. And this is in the building where I work in Gothenburg. And it took 29 separate scans on a scanning electron microscope to cover the awn of uh, a seed, Steepa pinata, which is actually under huge conservation pressure in Sweden, although it's more common across the rest of Europe. And it's a very interesting plant in the way it has to compete, the way it uses humidity to then twist itself into the soil. And it, it's incredible and it was incredible to walk into my workplace and be confronted by this plantness. And the works that uh, Brindis and Mark created in the Botanic Garden Many of those did this. They privileged stories that were underheard by humans. The, um, the detail in a, a seed surface and um, <clears throat> how the qualities of color and surface in that seed really became something of beauty and biology. And so I'm going to read a piece from the book um, that talks about those artworks and the research that we did in terms of thinking about teachers, students, and visitors to the Botanic Garden's impressions. And I want you to think about the role of art in this interstitial inter space, if you like, between, between science and, and art, and the way that art is a way of thinking. And one of the essays in the book talks about this very, in a very particular way. In this context, art not only offers visual beauty, but can unsettle and disrupt human perspectives on plantness. It may connect to one's emotions through the interpretation of what one sees. And it can also challenge the long held view. That these diverse connections are provoked is shown in some of the collected impressions of the teachers, students and public visitors participating in the research. In these impressions, our research participants saw beauty, but also stopped to think about biological diversity and how different plants are to humans. Changes of scale and extremes of size appear to provoke fascination. In high magnification, details appear that are not visible to the naked eye. And a seed is no longer just a seed. It is a unique object with a story to tell a story that is often invisible in a human-centric world. Sometimes, as in the case of the enlarged steeper awn, extreme magnification creates confusion, even in the identity of the object being witnessed and the viewer might wonder if they are indeed viewing a plant at all. This destabilization is key in the effectiveness of contemporary art. For audiences, the strategic implementation of uncertainty owns a new space of the imaginary where reappraisal, even to a small degree, inevitably must occur. Confusion can lead to curiosity and questions, and hence sensitize the viewer to educational and restorative affordances. The Swedish botanist Linnaeus wrote about the need for seeing and understanding plant life. The Beyond Plant Blindness Project and its associated works position art-based research in a central role in this Linnaean context for learning. Thus, through the act of questioning what they see in the artworks, visitors to botanic gardens were moved towards seeing new significance of plants in our world. 
So this is the book where you can read more about um, the artworks that were created especially for the project and also commentaries on a wider repertoire of questions around plants and gardens and their place in our world and these intersections between art, philosophy and science. And we were co-editors, Mark Wilson, Brindis Snebjons, Dottir and myself. And as you can see from the list of authors and editors, we came from a right, wide range of universities and we also covered a wide range of disciplines. So for example, here, Olaf, we have um, a museum curatorship and thinking about a curatorial view of the position. Lynn is visual studies and she takes a philosophical perspective. Ramsey teaches both biology education and philosophy of education. Giovanni edits a journal looking at the role of nature and visual culture and has brought out many books on why you look at plants and the relationship of art. Bente is a botanist in Lund. Margareta is, was our PhD student and she again looked at art and education. And Mark and Brindis are both our practicing artists who work a lot with both animals and plants and I urge you to go to their website. So I want to end by saying that the work was about coming to plants, was about coming to know plants in a way that was sensorial and was conceptual. And art acted as a broker in that space and science provided stories. And the Botanic Garden in Gothenburg was very much a participant in these interrelationships between art, science and education in which I work. And I hope you enjoy this evening. I look forward to the presentations by my colleagues. Thank you. Sven, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Let me share my slides. There you go. Um, hi, everyone. Um, really nice to be here tonight. Um, I have um, the great privilege to um, not only enthusiast, but also educate um, young students um, that uh, decide to come and study biology at our university. Um, it has been a, a very rewarding journey so far, um, but um, over the last few years when I started becoming more involved, especially in developing curricula and uh, pedagogies within my um, university department, I've noticed that there has been kind of like this upcoming trend of students that joining our biology degree programs and not only plant science, but also ecology, biology, human biology in particular, that they seem to have a, um, an, a plant awareness disparity of sorts, um, that they are um, not really familiar with plants, they don't seem to have necessarily an interest in plants themselves. And um, we decided to kind of like uh, start a little bit of an, an, an endeavor to figure out why that might be and also try to figure out how we can actually get them more enthusiastic about plants in the first place and get them more aware of plants in the uh, natural surrounding. Um, so as part of that, we started like a preliminary study a few years ago um, where we undertook some face-to-face uh, -face, uh, quizzes with our undergraduate students to kind of like almost quantify uh, plant blindness in them. So we had like picture sequences where we asked them to, to tell us what they see without even knowing that we're tested for plant awareness or plant disparity. Um, and then we kind of like had a follow-up questionnaire where we then tried to kind of like really tease apart um, where maybe um, some of these disparities come from. Maybe um, does it has to do with some of the um, education they, um, they have been exposed to at a younger age or some of the experience they had as children. And uh, then we kind of like related that information to the plant blindness score um, as such uh, for each of these students. Uh, and in particular, we were also really interested to see whether um, we can figure out um, um, if we do teach students, especially in their first year at university um, in plant sciences, and if you can give them more of an appreciation towards plants, whether they actually develop a more of an appreciation towards plants in their second and third year. Uh, so just some um, quick findings there. Um, I'm not going into too much detail there, um, but what was quite interesting to see was uh, we didn't find any difference between uh, males versus females with regards to their awareness of plants, um, at least not in our cohort we tested. It was a, a quite a small cohort, it was a quite a preliminary study, but uh, we're still working on it. Um, also what was surprising, we kind of like thought that um, 
you know, the students that might have more of an awareness towards plants might be students that either had a garden when they were growing up or had parents that uh, showed an inherent interest in plants and maybe kind of like, you know, brought up um, some of that um, interest in their in in the in the in the student in their in their children. Uh, but again, we found there was no differences between whether students had a garden or didn't have a garden. Uh, possibly um, having a garden doesn't doesn't necessarily mean you actually are engaging with the garden. Um, but uh, um, we, we didn't find a difference there. However, what was really interesting was that when we ask students to um, um, sub um, rate their um, uh, amount of content they were taught at school level with regards to plants and compared to um, zoology or human biology, that we found some really nice relationships between the awareness of plants and, for example, the amount of content they have been taught. So the more aware students were of plants uh, in our survey, the more they have been um, exposed to plant related content and at school level. Um, we also found what was really, really interesting and really, um, um, uh, um, really kind of like a, uh, a really nice result to see was that um, when we exposed students in level four to plant related content, about 65% of students um, were, showed more of an interest in plants than especially in the, in the level five and six in the second and, and, and final year. And they actually chose a, a, a high, a more of a higher number of modules um, with regards to plant sciences. Um, so that was really nice to see. So we can, if you get them early, uh, we, we, can, we, can, uh, we can change them, can change their minds to become more aware of plants, which was quite nice. Um, we then kind of like started thinking, well, how can we overcome some of these challenges in the future? Uh, I'm not going to go through all of these, but in, in, in general, what we really found was that um, we really need to tackle um, two different aspects um, with regards to plant, um, plant awareness disparity. One of them goes all the way down to school level, where we maybe have to introduce some new curriculum, curriculum components in teacher training courses that would allow us to really uh, allow teachers that go into schools and teach biology to implement more plants related content in the curriculum. Uh, at university level, what we really noticed when we spoke to our students that um, they really wanted to see more of an application of plant related content in their lectures and also have some um, practical experiences with actually working with plants. So some of our students that come to us, even the plant scientists, they can't even keep a plant alive. So what we have now is started developing some challenges with our students where we give them a seed at the beginning of their first year. And for example, they have to grow a plant for the remaining three years of their degree program. And then they get an award at the end of it. Um, so we kind of came up with some um, really interesting um, improvements we could suggest on how to combat plant um, awareness disparity. Uh, but what always helps is plant, uh, students always love eating and they always love to um, seem to be talking about recreation of plant, uh, plant uh, based drugs. Um, so we're definitely going to be integrating some of these discussions more in our lectures from now on. Um, thank you very much. Happy to take questions after that as well. Thanks. Thanks, Sven. Over to you, Sophie. Thank you very much. Um, so as a botanist, um, when I look at plants in, in the street, I get kind of automatically excited um, and I'm always very surprised you know, when I talk to people and they, they don't react in, in the same way somehow. They, they see plants and when they're not particularly you know, interested and a lot of the time they see them as, as obstacles. Um, so I've, I kind of started you know, to, to think about that, that aspect and why do people see plants as, as weeds really? Um, so this is you know, something I decided to, to look at. And you know, most of the time in our cities, what we see is plants being sprayed, being removed. Um, people talk about, you know, plants growing in, in the streets in cities as, as weeds. Um, and one of the popular saying is, is that weed is, is a plant or a flower growing in the one place. Um, so when you think about our cities, you know, they're, they're home to hundreds of spontaneous plant species. Um, and yet, um, you know, potentially we might go to a nature reserve or, um, you know, a park to look at plants that we have planted or wildflowers. When those plants are in cities, they are seen as undesirable, as obstacles to be removed, to be sprayed, um, and etc. So I kind of started looking at, at the history of this. And when you look at the history, you actually realize that this has been going on for a very long time. So you've got a painting here from the 19th century. Um, and on the right here, you've got an advert for a pesticide, a herbicide, uh, from the um, early to, uh, 20th century. 
So people have been trying to get rid of plants for a very long time. Um, but on the other hand, they've also been growing them. So I'm quite interested in that dichotomy between in our relationship with plants, because I think, um, you know, plant blindness, however you call it, this um, lack of, um, you know, re kind of realization of the importance of plants has roots in that dichotomy. Um, what, you know, what if um, bringing people, you know, plants to people's attention in our cities could help change things? And I've been inspired um, by an initiative that happened first in France and that has, you know, slowly been spreading to other countries. Um, so in France, pesticide use in cities was banned um, in, in 2017. And as a result of that, plants have been coming back on pavements, um, you know, on streets, on, on, in gutters, um, all those places where they would, you know, typically be seen as undesirable. Um, and they, there was an initiative started by the French Natural History Museum, actually, and um, uh, the botanical society called Terra Botanica, uh, which is called Sauvage de Maru, White Plants of My Street. And the idea behind that was to bring plants to people's attention, try to make people, you know, see plants in their gutters on their pavements as, you know, being part of the biodiversity, being part of the ecosystem, the urban ecosystem. Um, so the, this initiative has been really successful um, and for example the city of Lyon as you can see here on the left have actually been you know publicizing it and putting a positive spin on plants which I think is particularly interesting so this idea of going from you know plants are obstacles they're dirty they shouldn't be here to could we potentially see them as you know desirable see them as part of our of, of our cities um, so they published and, and they printed those huge billboards in, in the city um, saying, you know, when plants come back in, in the city, life is coming back to, to cities. This is good. You know, this is positive. You shouldn't be worried about it. You shouldn't, you know, start complaining about it. Um, and they, you know, they published those um, all around, the, all around the, the city with a bit of artwork. So they had a competition around it as well, uh, trying to involve some local artists. Um, and I think, you know, potentially, um, this could be a way of, of bringing, um, you know, people's um, attention to plants rather than, you know, seeing them kind of unseeing them somehow. Um, so can this, you know, be adopted on a more general scale? Um, it has been successful somehow in, in, in France. People are, are starting, you know, slowly things are changing. People are accepting more plant life in our, in our cities. Um, so I started as a result of, you know, the... the um, the, uh, the um, initiative in France, I started more than weeds in the UK. And the response has been, you know, phenomenal. I've been, um, you know, giving interviews and, and having media interest and interest from, you know, plant enthusiasts in, in about 15 different countries. Um, and again, getting coverage on very unusual, um, you know, um, outlets. So not typical, you know, scientific or, or outlets, things like Hello Magazine or Positive News Online. Um, and potentially, I think, um, adopting this on, on the larger scale, if we can get people living in cities, which is, you know, the majority of, of people nowadays living in, in, our, in cities. Um, so what if, um, you know, bringing people's um, attention to plants um, that live on their local pavements on the local street could have a bigger impact? Thank you very much. Thanks, Sophie. And our last presentation is Geetanjali. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I am Geetu. I'm an art and design pedagogue and have been exploring plants and botanical motifs in the Indian cultural context. Um, it's a pleasure to be part of this event today. Um, many congratulations, Dawn, on the launch of your book. It promises to be a very valuable resource for plant study through art. I'd also like to thank Dawn, Patma, and the Linnean Society for inviting me here this evening. I'm really happy to be part of this conversation on plant blindness and ways to uh, build plant awareness. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay. So um, I started looking closely at plants while documenting street art and design in India over 10 years ago. I teach at Srishti, it's an art and design institute in Bangalore in South India. And I began taking images of decorative motifs starting um, in 2009 to use primarily as teaching resources. Uh, while doing so, I started noticing a wide variety of botanical representations, whether it was in floor art, wall art, vehicular art, 
or in architectural elements in the built environment. Um, in this slide, you can see my obsession with the Lotus a few years ago. Um, so uh, whenever I took a series of images, plant motifs invariably kept popping up. And I began wondering what these botanical images were telling us as members of a street audience. And why was I seeing so many of them? So when I delved deeper, I realized that street art and design offered a very strong a pedagogical opportunity to learn about the botanical world. And there is so much to learn about plants via their users on the street. Um, okay. So I'll start with this slide, okay. Um, so I didn't grow up uh, witnessing Hindu religious rites at home because I was brought up as a Sikh, but over time I kept seeing on the street that both real plants and plant representations were deeply connected with people's religious lives. The images of the bus on the left are from my neighborhood in Bangalore where I live. The bus has been decorated with banana leaves and a priest is bending over two plates of fruit. This is on the street. So I took these images during Ayut Puja, which is a worship ritual uh, where Hindus pray and offer gratitude to their tools, instruments, and to the equipment that they use. Um, the image in the middle at the bottom is of a white pumpkin that's been smashed uh, to the ground, on the ground. And this act is actually part of the Ayut Puja ritual. And according to one explanation, it's supposed to be symbolic of animal sacrifice. And the watery flesh of the vegetable and its round shape resembles an animal's torso. The red powder that's sprinkled over its flesh is similar to blood trails, which is what you see um, during animal sacrifice. And on the right is a priest praying at a temple shrine. And this temple has been constructed actually where two trees, a people and a banyan tree are growing intertwined together. Um, apart from the visibly sacred rituals uh, encountered on the street, there are other rituals with plants that I see. Um, this was in January during COVID where I started documenting plants in trash. Um, I kept seeing little piles of rice outside homes and then I came across this pile of pea skins. Um, I met my vegetable vendor nearby told me that the peas, that peas were in season and that I must buy them now and freeze them because they were one third the price. Uh, but while I was wondering about the trash that this generated right outside his shop, I saw this cow come up and the skins vanished in no time. The cow had eaten up the entire pile in a matter of minutes. And um, there's a concept in Hinduism, it's called Annadan, which means you share your food with all living creatures. Uh, Dan is a Sanskrit term that refers to generosity, the act of giving something. So the rice that I keep seeing thrown on streets and that I, that I thought was trash, and these pea skins, for example, they actually, you know, plants as food offering, intentionally being left out for animals and insects. Um, well, I started out first by looking at decorative plant motifs in street art and design practices. For example, the image on the left is of a kolam drawing. It's a traditional floor art practice done in South India. But then I saw the street as an environment holding so many other uses of plants. The image on the right shows a piece of lime tucked under a car tire, again during Ayut Puja. Crushing lime is also part of the Ayut Puja ritual. And one of the reasons why lime is used is because when it's pierced, it releases an odor that purifies the air around it. Also, it's a bitter sour fruit. And another story says that draining its juice is symbolic of getting rid of the sourness and bitterness around you. So, um, you know, be it symbolic or decorative, there are really so many ways to learn about plants. And the street is just one such way but it's a very strong pedagogical location to discover many different ideas about the plant world. And this really has been the heart of my research for the past uh, four or five years. And uh, I'm really happy to have been able to share uh, some of it with you this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much everyone um, for all your presentations. It was really great learning about this. I'd first like to ask Sandy a question. Um, is, you know, we talk about plant blindness and would like, how did this come by? I know the term is, I mean, recent, but has it intensified over time? And I know that you talk about historically, plants have been shown to be inferior to us, to human beings. Um, has that been disproven, which I, by science over time, and has that made a difference? Well, I mean, it kind of goes back to what was called the scale of nature, the scala naturi, that was the idea was that that organisms with more complex bodies were considered to be better. 
So, so life was considered to go from the less complex to the more complex. And because, because plants behave in a very different way and a different scale to humans, it was often that things went from plants up, up this, this ladder. And one of the things that's interesting about the Scala Naturi is human beings are always at the top. So anything that's different, the more different something is from us, the less good it is or the less complex it is. So that's why in a way we feel empathy and things by um, with, with other vertebrates that have other mammals that have eyes and hair like we do. And that's that sort of when you when you talk to people, when you show picture pictures of, of things to people, they see a, a lion lying in an acacia tree. They see the lion, but never see the acacia tree. Of course, people who are all attuned to plants and don't have what Kate Parsley calls plant um, awareness deficit actually see the acacia tree. So I think it, it's something that's very much comes from that that the idea of of a scale of nature and that and that complexity means higher on the evolutionary scale. Now, of course, everything that's around today is at the same evolutionary. We're all, we're all extant lineages. We're all lineages which are alive today. So no one of us is more primitive or more advanced. We're just on different lineages on the tree of life. And so that's, that's something that actually is still quite difficult um, to get across is the fact that that there isn't an early branch so mosses are not an early branch of plants for example they are a lineage of plants which just happens to have a different body type to a baobab tree yeah um while sophie was presenting i was thinking how when i was a child my mom always pointed out leaves on the ground which would be fuzzy which would be you know the seasonal plants which would come and die, and she always said, "Those are bad plants. Those are plants that we don't need. Those are plant, you know, those are weeds." So my question is: Is uh, permanence or a permanent presence for a plant uh, considered, you know, important? Is most most important? If they are not permanent, they are not important. Like trees. Mm -hmm. I think. I think if I I, I take that one, I think it's uh, it's it's a difficult um, dichotomy to make really because um, um, you know plants can be very um, elaborate in their display or in their um, you know um, in their display when they um, when they might, when they might um, flower or they might uh, fruit uh, which might attract a lot of people might attract a lot of attention make people quite aware of that organism but they might only live for a short time it doesn't necessarily mean um, they don't have the right to be there or they don't deserve the same appreciation than a plant does that has been around for uh, thousands of years, like for example, some, uh, some trees. Um, I don't think we shouldn't, we shouldn't, we should be quite careful that we don't put plants into uh, awareness categories as such and, and say like only because it's a tree and it lives longer, it might be taller or this particular flower is more, um, has a, a ni nicer kind of like petal arrangement uh, it should be more appreciated i think every plant has the has the right to be appreciated in the same way um i think one of the points then we made which was quite interesting the complexity um, aspect is also that um a lack of of um, of interest in plants also sometimes comes with a lack of understanding of the organisms and we get a lot of students that come um, come to my courses and say like, oh, I don't want to do plant science or I don't want to do a plant related module because it's very complicated and I, I don't understand it. Um, and I think it's because of that we really need to start teaching people how to um, become slowly more familiar with, with plants as such and appreciate them more and eventually um, the more exposure you have towards plants, the more you understand, the more you can learn, the faster you learn, the more you appreciate over time. And that knowledge needs to be then passed down. Um, but it's, uh, I don't think we should really say that we should label plants as um, in any category in any way, I don't think. And I think one of the things is that people don't think of plants as having bodies. Mm. But plants do have bodies. They have body shapes and body sizes. They're just a bit more plastic and a bit, they're a bit better at having bodies than we are, to be perfectly honest. Plants are much better at having bodies than our mm. mammals. Mm. But I think there's a, there's a lot of, um, you know, a, a lack of knowledge and a lack of understanding and sometimes a fear. I mean, you know, I've been giving walks and, and you know, leading people 
um, uh, around showing them plants. And sometimes what I feel is, you know, well, this is kind of an unknown organism. You know, they, they know obviously trees and flowers they plant in their gardens, but people with white plants, they've got a very different relationship. And I think, you know, I think you're right, Sven, in, in saying, you know, we shouldn't be categorizing plants, but we have to acknowledge the fact that in, you know, in people's minds, um, you know, in the mind of people who, um, you know, potentially suffer from plant blindness, there may be this kind of dichotomy between, you know, the plants we understand, the ones we eat, the vegetables, you know, the flowers in our gardens, and the rest of them, I think. Yeah, I think so. That's a really good point, because we almost need like a, or what I probably would term access plants, like plants that um, get you excited to get you into into um, into botany or into plant science. And then eventually, when you have grabbed their attention, that's where you can give them all the juicy plants, you know, the ones no one really uh, thinks are, are actually around them in the first place. Yeah, it's a really good point. It's, it's really interesting, um, you know, leading kids, for example, you know, children on the wall, because they get really ex easily excited, you know, by plants their parents wouldn't, you know, just because they've got, you know, fuzzy leaves or a funny color, um, you know, flower color or, um, you know, they're a bit sticky or something like that. And I think we need to capitalize on that, especially, you know, even with adults and, you know, look at how we can make plants more accessible to adults in that way as well, you know, capitalize on the diversity of the, of the plants. Mm -hmm. And yeah. also, of course, of the, um, um, from an educational point, really important as well, um, always to remember that people learn and experience in different ways as well. Like um, one person might be more vid, um, a visual learner. So, you know, you need to kind of like emphasize that in how you, how you demonstrate or how you kind of like uh, show them plants or let them experience, uh, get an experience with plants. But other people might be um, more of a kinesthetic kind of like uh, um, in inclination and you, they might want to engage with the material or, um, so there's different um, people that learn in different ways. And I think if you try to combat plant blindness, overcome uh, that disparity um, we, we observe more frequently now that we really have to focus not only on one aspect and as Dawn put it so nicely, I think art can really help us to, to stretch across a lot of uh, these different spheres, uh, the educational sphere and also the botanical, I think quite nicely. Yeah. I think, I think Sven has mastered the art of, sorry, Don, you were going in. Sorry, go ahead, Don. I just wanted to say that um, to draw on that, um, in our research, we actually found that people were drawn to the difference. And I remember one interview that really stuck out for me is uh, a woman who'd seen uh, a series of photographs by Moybridge on um, horse embryos. And she said, I can see there, I can see a likeness with the human embryo, but when I come to the pictures of the plant seeds, it feels so different, so other. However, I'm drawn to that otherness. I, I want to go to the other and, and really look. And I think that one of the things that the artworks did is they um, catalyzed curiosity and questions and they, they were provocational. And I think that sometimes we want art to give us comfort. And, and that's not what we want art to do really with plants. We want to put this discomfort, this disparity and 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 draw people towards the difference and I think that um, we found as well that changes in scale really did create curios curiosity and sensitize people towards maybe not knowing the plant better but asking questions that would bring them to that relationship and it's as an educator I'm always interested in how we provoke conversations around organisms rather than telling a story we invite people into a story. And I think that art does that as well. And Brindis and Mark always talk about parities in meeting. You know, how can we bring these meetings together? You know, what kind of conversations can we set up about this difference, this otherness? I'd be interested in what Gatanjali wants to, would say about this. Yeah. But I have a daughter who's an artist and, and, and one of the things she says that if you feel comfortable with art, it's not doing its job. Mm. I agree, yeah. Well, you know, I think the aesthetic is a really powerful medium by which to hook attention. I mean, there's no, no doubt about that. But I think um, as education, especially being an educator, we, we need to push the function of art beyond that. But um, at the onset, uh, at least teaching beginning level students who come in in their foundation years, um, uh, using art as a hook to, to raise those questions, it, the, the entry point has inevitably been the aesthetic encounter. Yeah, I have a question for you, Gitanjali. Is that 
I know that, you know, we love florals. Every day I get an email from Marks and Spencer or somebody saying florals are back. I mean, florals have always been here. We love a tree on a tote bag or a bed sheet. And I know that these motifs are used in India and many other countries in street art, but does that necessarily um, equal, you know, a conservation motive or an actual connection with the natural world? Or is it just being uh, used as a form? And, you know, that it's, that in this manner, when we use, is art also just utilitarian? Uh, you're right. I don't think uh, it, that raises a critical consciousness in any way, you know, but I think you can leverage it to, to push the boundaries uh, in terms of questioning uh, the role plants play in society, you know. Uh, I remember at the, I mean, once when, we, when I started, we were teaching and um, I, my entry point was using an artist, uh, you know, plants used by an artist, and then we took it in, in our directions. And at the end of the, the it was a, it, it was a course on ephemeral art. And uh, uh, one of the students' performances, she took us up to the terrace of the campus and she sort of had this elaborate ritual that she designed. And she handed us all an aloe vera plant. And she said, um, well, this is my sacred plant. And we said, why is this sacred to you? She says, because it cleans the blemishes off my face. So I'd like to pray to this plant, you know? But you, yeah. you have to sort of take the conversation in different ways. Uh, yeah. But art is definitely... So, so that brings me to something, and I'm gonna I'm gonna just bring one of the questions which has come up in the chat, which I think is really interesting, is that um, oftentimes, and Sven, you might want to comment on this, is students often see plants as boring because they just sit there, and but they but the, when they learn about the environmental stresses that plants are under, and I teach with John Bridal, who's at University College London, we teach. Um, we, we do a small piece in a in a ecological behavior course about plant behavior. And, and talk about how the different kinds of stresses and and this always comes down. It always ends up have being a discussion about free will is do plants have free will? But what do you think about this? I, I Because one of the things that's always struck me is that people think that plants just sit there, but actually they have very active lives. They're just going on at a very different scale and tempo to the lives that we lead. Yeah, I think Dawn already pointed that out that I think the scale is important, but not only mm -hmm. the scale, so the temporal aspect, as you said yourself, is quite crucial because you can visualize movement of plants like using time lapse photography or videos nowadays as well. And there's a, a whole set of like technologies we kind of like use for our students, including thermal imagery. We can actually visualize physiological responses that happen as soon you expose them to a bit of air or a bit of water. Um, and you can actually actively see that life in front of you. And I think that captures the imagination of a lot of students um, or mm -hmm. making direct links to, um, to plants that, um, that do actually move. There are a, a, a large number of plants that actually physically move in their, throughout their life, life cycle. A good example is nomadic vines in tropical forests. They start growing up with the tree, then sometimes they lose detachment from the forest floor and then regain it somewhere else and then actually actively move across forest trees and and I think that captures really the imagination of students um, but without them being shown how um, plants actually move and act be actively involved and engaged in the environment um, you know it makes it really difficult for them sometimes to relate to it um, so I think from an educational point of view I think it's really important that we find creative ways of demonstrating that. And that gets them really excited and they get really, really excited, especially when you implement some of the technologies like modern technologies and plant sciences now. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, of course, Charles Darwin's first book after he wrote on the origin of species was a book about orchids. Mm. And then about the fourth one was about the movements of plants. Mm. So, I mean, Charles Darwin was a botanist, let's face it. <laughs> <laughs> he did not have plant awareness disparity, awareness disparity. He certainly did not. But, um, but he did a bunch of really fun experiments with plants that, that anybody can recreate, which is quite fun. Some of which have actually been recreated on uh, the European Space um, Station as well, mm -hmm. uh, where they've actually taken some of these experiments and some really interesting videos as well. You can actually download if anyone has an interest online as well. Um, and I, I do show my students that sometimes as well. But I think it's just really important to make this connection and to kind of like, um, give students not only the opportunity to um, in kind of like uh, experience plants but also show them what's they what the potential of plants is as well 
Um, and you know, there's, there's a lot of creative ways you can do it. I mean, sometimes we actually use video games in some of my sessions uh, that have been developed by paleobotanists in Germany. We can actually walk through the Carboniferous periods and kind of like uh, experience uh, uh, um, um, giant lycopod trees and things like that. And, and, and I think students do relate to that because they, I think they, especially nowadays, they grow up in a very different world to what we maybe have, have grown into. I mean, especially with the internet nowadays. So I think it, it, it really helps making it relatable. So, so Dawn, do you think, do you think some of the kind of, um, some of the impact of the artworks that you did as part of the project is partly the kind of the thing of looking at them and thinking, what is that? Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, Brenda Samark did a really good job of choosing aspects of plantness that, that drew us to, um, particularly there, there were a series of um, photographs of seeds, but the seeds were the large focus of the picture. And then the the portrait of the adult plant was in a sort of grayscale behind. Mm. And then there was a sort of scientific footnote, which was the interview with the curator who collected the seed. So it was all this flipping of the story, if you like, so that you privilege a part of the story that's usually invisible and you present that to the viewer to draw them in. in yeah. Uh, and, and the other thing I was, I was looking at some of the questions in the chat. There's some people asking about, um, being socially socially acceptable to, to kill plants and, and I think that one of the ethical discussions we had with the work as well is that um, Brindis and Mark had this special uh, tank made for growing seeds that were the seeds the living version if you like of the photograph seeds and there was a long discussion and a very clear ethical commitment to not harming or or putting excess pressure on those plants so having a series of plants that were in greenhouses and nurtured by a, a horticulturalist so that being part of the art didn't oppress the living plant and i think that's something to consider because there's a couple of questions in the chat saying you know about the instrumentalization of plants to make art and i think that 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 needs to be discussed and i and i think that there are in humanities work and philosophy work, there are some deep discussions about critical plant studies that are akin to critical animal studies. And if you look at works of the 1960s around education, there's some, there's some terrible things that say, yeah, well, we can use plants in the laboratory because you can subject them to this. They don't have nerves. You can cut them up. You can do this, that, and that. And at the end of your lesson, you can just throw them in a bin. And I find that quite morally abhorrent, actually, as someone who has worked so closely with plants. But I think we've we've still to come away from that kind of attitude. And there was a beautiful blog post written during um, the pandemic last year from a post. I think she's either a doctoral or postdoctoral student in Aberdeen. And she had written about trying to access the plants in the library at her university and she could see them through the glass and she could see they were slowly dying from lack of water and she talked very eloquently of our responsibility to creating an aesthetic with plants but then how do we live with that aesthetic and how do we nurture it and, and i agree that sometimes people see house plants as an aesthetic object that isn't living in the true sense of, you know we someone in the chat said we wouldn't throw our pets away after they die um, why would we do that to plants? And I think there's a moral juncture here that, again, artists can draw attention to. And I think, in a way, the Albrecht Dürer painting, he draws us to the lives of these incredibly ordinary plants and he makes them, he brings them to our eye, um, viscerally public. I mean, Giovanni Alloy has written about this is visceral, vibrant life in our face. And I think art can what do does that. ordinary really mean? Yeah, what does it mean? Ordinary. What does it really what does mean? Ordinary mean. Yeah, it does. And I was wondering, Sven, about um, Darwin's experiments in the uh, in a non-gravity situation. And one of my favorite, very uh, very exquisitely visual Darwin experiment is when he takes uh, one of his old toenails and he places it on a carnivorous plant. I mean, 
Imagine doing that in a gravity free situation and the toenail floating away from the plant. I think young people would really love that narrative. You know, is it possible to replicate the old toenail experiment? That, well, that, I like the bassoon. I'm not sure. And urine, for instance, <laughs> urine on kind of yeah. I mean, there's a whole space stuff going on there. Yeah. I, I'm not sure if my students would appreciate if I get my old toenail out, um, but. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, it's, 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 it's a great idea to replicate some of these old studies as well. I mean, that's possible. We, I haven't personally done uh, much of those replications from older studies whatsoever. But again, uh, recreating zero gravity in the classroom, again, that's probably quite an expensive undertaking. Um, but what you could do instead, like, and what I have to done with our first year students in uh, plant biodiversity at the moment is actually, uh, when we talk about plant evolution, we talk about, you know, how plants actually um, kind of like start colonizing our planet and instead of like just talking about the colonization of plants on our planet I actually posed this question at the beginning of the sessions how we would, would we um, uh, terraform Mars um, because it's quite topical with you know Matt Damon as the Martian uh, trying to survive on Mars and trying to grow his own vegetables and survive as the as the botanist of a of a, a, the Hollywood industry at the moment and I try I give the students the challenge to actually come up with a, a solution based on um, physical properties of plants and the atmosphere and how we would go about terraforming Mars using what we know from the fossil record, um, um, which I teach them throughout throughout the plant biodiversity course. And they really love it um, because it it makes them engaged. They can relate to, um, to uh, the movie industry. They can relate to uh, people they might have seen on TV um it, it's a different approach um and yeah that, that gets students quite excited i'm not sure about the zero gravity um experiments i'm not sure if i can necessarily justify the costs the where, <laughs> someone's asked in the chat where to find find those films and they're nasa I, nasa has them on their open website yeah but, yeah. Um, but i'd like to get back to sort of the idea about 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 otherness and to think about and to think a bit about otherness because, because I think that's sort of what Sophie, what Sophie is doing in a way is showing that, that these plants which are growing up in our sidewalk cracks are not other. They're just, they're there with us. They're, 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 they're part of us. So, so part of the trouble with, with conservation and, and thinking about, about biodiversity loss and everything is that humans are off for, for many decades, centuries were set apart from the rest of nature. Nature was nature and humans were humans. And so I think one of the things you've done, Sophie, is kind of bring together that idea about um, about about being they're not being an other. And so how do you how does that how does that work? How do you feel how that works with people who you take on tours? Um, it's really interesting, you know, the relationship um, that that people have with plants. When you know, when I, when I take people on tours, or when I, I do a lot on social media as well. So you know, I, I collect a lot of reactions from people about about plants, um, and, it's, and it's very interesting because there's such a diversity, you know, within the same country and between countries. So for example, you know, a typical weed, bittercress, uh, which is absolutely hated in in the UK. Um, is a celebrated plant in, in Japan. You know, it's one of the seven spring uh, celebration, you know, plants, for example, and people have a very different relationship with it. Um, so I think we have to, you know, be careful about, you know, seeing plants as, and categorize, categorizing, you know, plants as being useful, not useful, uh, you know, weeds, garden plants, that, that thing. Uh, but it's very interesting to see, you know, how people react when I say to them, you know, this, this is, for example, you know, this plant was brought um, in the 18th century with the travels and it's it's become um, you know a particularly interesting plant for, for pollinators or it's got a specific use it was brought for a specific use um, you, you know for example and and people don't have no idea of those um, that kind of background you know plants are often seen as you know green things around us but not necessarily as um, you know part of our environment nobody would um, you know, you, you would say, oh, you know, a, a fox is, is obviously, you know, it's part of urban nature or a pigeon or, you know, a blackbird is, is part of urban nature. But then when you, when you, you know, show to them, um, I don't know, a London rocket, for example, you know, quite a common weed in tree pits, for example, and people don't, you know, see that as, as being part of, of the London environment or, you know, the urban environment somehow. And I found that quite fascinating. So what I've been doing with, with the project and is, you know, obviously trying to show people that this is all part of, of a bigger thing somehow. And they're part of it, 
the plants are part of it, the animals are part of it, and it's all kind of integrated. And I think, you know, obviously there's the issue of, of plants versus animals, but there's also obviously a, a disconnect, you know, from nature. Someone was mentioning, you know, the fact that people are behind screens and things like that. And I think there is this disconnect between, you know, the people and, and the natural world in, in general. And I think potentially plants, as well as animals, but plants could be a really interesting way of addressing that and reconnecting people with, with the, uh, the natural world. There's sort of an entry, an entry way that, I mean, that's in a way taking advantage of the fact that they just sit there. Yes. And people don't realize, you know, they sit there. I had so many people when I started the project last year saying, you know, I've been walking in, in front of that plant for, you know, years and I've never kind of noticed it. It's only because there was, you know, a chalk name or because you spoke about it that I actually started looking at it, which I found very interesting. So I'm going to ask another question of, of, of everybody, really, and, and wonder if, if, um, if the panelists feel that that there's sort of two arguments for kind of caring about something. There's the kind of intrinsic argument that you care for it because it is. And then there's the instrumental argument, which is that you care for it because it does something for you. So in your experience, all of you, kind of what, which of those arguments resonates best with people? Or do you think, because one of the things that happened, you know, in the 1980s and 90s is that the, the appeal to save biodiversity because it could help us failed miserably. Mm -hmm. So maybe using the instrumentalist argument of that we should we should appreciate these things because they're good for us or they do something for us is not the way to go. I mean, I, I, it's interesting that you ask that because in, if you look at our first year students in particular, um, they really need that uh, argument with regards to, you know, what does it do for us? Um, can we can we can we eat it? Can we use it as a medicine? Can we can we use that plant to help us breathe, etc.? Um, so they're more interested, especially at the earlier um, point of the education, of you know what does it do for us. But over time, especially now when they graduate, especially our plant science students, they really started showing more of an appreciation towards plants, not because they're doing something for us, but just for the sake of being. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that has to do with um, a, a kind of mental education development where they have to kind of start appreciating something and ex being exposed to something for a long time to then make that realization that uh, you can love something or appreciate something just for, this, for the sake of it being there, not necessarily because it does something for you. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's from what I experienced from university. Yeah, Katanjali, what do you, do you, well, how do you feel, how does that kind of resonate with you, the usefulness versus the kind of just just for them up for their own selves for their own selves you know um honestly i that's a really tough one i found i mean at least in my teaching uh, i've found that the ins instrumentalist view um uh, often legitimizes a whole semester that you spend teaching about plants right because you, you you say it's 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 important to learn about plants for this reason especially in art and design where, where design has a function in your your sort of uh you know, you're seeing it as either problem solving or a problem framing activity. But um, I think this shift that we need to make from, from looking at it because you, uh, because you can use it towards just looking at it because you're fascinated by it or because you, you think it's beautiful. I think that's really where the power of um, art has come in, where, where it takes it away from design and into the realm of, you know, um, myth, fantasy, imagination, which really have no utility, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a question for Gitanjali and Don. Um, Don, in your book, uh, there was this phrase that really interested me. It was uh, attention restoration, and what we're essentially trying to do when we can't see plants is restoring the attention to particular parts of our environment. And like Gitanjali said, in a way, sacred trees do that. Is that they bring your attention to certain parts because of their markings and because of how they have been given prominence in a landscape. And Dawn, you also talked about botanical gardens and that the design of botanical gardens restores our attention, particularly to their form and function in a way that public parks possibly don't, which are just kind of a wash of green. But I mean, is there a space for good considered public space design? And if you know of ways, and Sophie, this kind of builds into your work as well is that you're restoring attention to a particular part of the environment. 
um, which is different from people who go for tree walks because people who go for tree walks are already interested in trees. What we need is to bring in people who are not interested in trees. So how do we do that? And also, also people who are not able to access it as well. I think, you know, this is one of the things that I found with, you know, pavement plants, everyone has got pavement, you know, you don't need to go somewhere active, you don't need to go to a park or a reserve or have a garden, you can just, you know, go go in your street, I think. Um, and I think this is something, you know, we really need to, to capture. Yeah. I think I, 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 I'm going to speak about some work I, I, before I went to Sweden, a long time before, and when I first met Sandy, as I worked at the Chelsea Physic Garden in London. And it's an interesting garden. It's a botanic garden, but it's also a physic garden. And I used to work with some really interesting community projects. And two of the projects I worked with, one was with uh, Al Hassaniya, uh, Older Moroccan Women's Project. And these were women who lived in tower blocks and went to a community centre in North Kensington. So, so very little green space, but, but we, we connected through an idea of thinking about the Botanic Garden as a, as, a, as a place where you could rebuild connections with knowledge that you, you as, a, as an immigrant brought with you, but then you had nowhere to express it. So then we would bring communities um, down to the garden and we'd have picnics um, and people would walk around and find their place in the garden. So, so bring this inner world to the external world. And I remember when we started planning this meeting, uh, Gita and Jali talked about the frame we bring to bear on plants. And I, I've thought about that expression a lot. And, and this was really powerful um, work. And then what happened is we, we went with some of the community workers to meet women in the Atlas Mountains, working with plants, weaving and dyeing and collected knowledge there. And we brought that back to then reshare with the women in Ahasania. And finally, they got a grant to build a Moroccan garden near the community center. So there is iterative cycles of inner knowledge, externalized knowledge spaces in these places. Then the other people that we worked with was the Medical Foundation for Victims of Torture. And they, they, were with, they worked in an allotment, but they also had, uh, Jenny Grutz was a psychologist who worked with, with this community of people. And I remember being asked to give a guided tour. And I remember thinking this was a very complex task because I was thinking about notions of home. If you have been tortured, notions of home are very complicated. So a plant that brings up feelings about home could bring warmth and love, but also pain and anguish because home was the place where you were tortured. So I think that this, this attention rest restoration is an interesting one because it can take you to a place of calm and peace and restore your attention to something, but it can also take you to a place of past history where it might have been problematic. So certain plants might not speak of warm furry places to us. They might indicate a very challenging history, human history. And for the plants themselves, you know, where we put them in a botanic garden might cause them distress. The pruning that goes on, the, the regimentation. Um, and someone wrote in the chat earlier, what are we doing to plants when we press them in a herbarium and they dry out? And I mean, Sandy, you're very familiar with this. But, yeah. but I'm thinking about Gitanjali, your representations in the city where you see them. And I love that story where you were curious about the pile of of rice and the peas and, and, and what was the motivation for them being there? And I think that's a big question for all of us as working with arts, education and science. You know, why are we asking these questions and what kinds of frames do we bring to bear on them? And, and the human plant re relationship is so complicated and, and contentious and, and we can't assume that everyone has the same relationship with plants. And, and I knew Jim Wandersey, who was the professor who worked with Elizabeth Schusler on this original theory. And he was amazing. He really had this art, science, literature, really rich view of the world. And he brought all those things to bear. I think in a way, in a way, and this is what I, I said in the article that I wrote for you, Dawn, in your, in your, your people, people, plants, planet um, issue is that, is that I think that actually we have a bigger problem than just plant awareness. 
disparity we or plant blindness we have we have an anything that's not mammals problem because insects are also i mean insects are feared i i feel that my my greatest achievement during the pandemic the single most important thing i did was teach my three-year-old next door neighbor not to be frightened of butterflies you know that's the that is the most important thing i did all pandemic was that you know and i think and i think so 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 it's part of so so solving solving you know rest, restoring attention to plants is not the end of the story it's about restoring attention to to everything in a way and that and that brings me to something someone said in the chat is that is that it that they thought that it would be helpful to increase people's appreciation of plants by connecting them to stories of of other parts of nature and I think that kind of brings in the sort of this idea that it that it's that it's the connectivity, the connectivity of things, and you know megafauna and megaflora and charismatic fauna and charismatic flora, you know um, that's that's w one way in. But I think you know Sophie is appreciating the things that everyone else thinks should be pulled up in streets and and. Yeah. I've actually been doing, you know, making on social media and, you know, in talks and everything, quite a lot of connection with invertebrates. I mean, I'm, I'm, an, I'm an amateur entomologist, so that kind of, you know, I'm, that's one of my other passions. But I think it's very important because people have got so little knowledge. So, for example, you know, people think plants are only useful to insects when they're, they've got, you know, big showy flowers. They don't realize, you know, about caterpillars, larvae, um, you know, um, wintering, overwintering, they don't realize that those relationships. And, you know, I've had so many people say, oh, you know, I didn't know that, for example, you know, by leaving, um, you know, dead stems in winter, I could help insects. And I think this is, as you say, you know, this, this is a, a whole kind of relation. It's not one, one yeah. organism, it's the relationship which has to be kind of reconnected in people's minds and, and understood better. And it's we're an very interesting... linear thinkers. I mean, human beings are quite linear thinkers. Mm -hmm. we're, we're quite good at going from A to B to C to D to E, you know, like that instead of wandering our way around in the world. I mean, when Sophie earlier said as well that, you know, um, access to nature and that, you know, you could just step outside onto, you, onto your pavement and uh, observe uh, plants and biodiversity. Um, but I mean, there's always still this kind of like argument and I don't know what the other panel members think, but um, and we know that about 75% of all humans live in cities now. Um, so by default, your um, exposure is reduced to, um, to the biodiversity around you, including plants. Um, yes, there are you know, those lovely jewels you have sitting on your pavements, and yes, you still have um, some, some uh, nature around you, but uh, it's, it's much, much harder to see, uh, unless someone points it out like Sophie does a lot of the times. Um, but, um, you know, I mean, there is still this general debate whether, um, you know, we should maybe change the way we actually build our cities and develop our, our living space um, to kind of accommodate and combat kind of like this disparity a bit more, maybe having greener cities. There's definitely, definitely people are thinking about that. And, and, uh, and I, I'm really encouraged. It took us a long time to get the council to not weed kill our street, but now it's a really interesting place. I find very fun things there. <laughs> well, that, yeah. that's, that's the thing, you know, people don't realize. Um, and I, I think someone in the chat was mentioning about the stories behind the plants. And this is something else, you know, there's obviously the, the, the insects and the ecological relationship, but the cultural relationships, you know, with the plants, how they got imported, you know, the story um, of how they come to, came to the country, you know, with imports and, and trade and things like that. And people are really fascinated about that. That's something, you know, I didn't expect that to be touching and, you know, striking such a core of people, but it seems to be really um, capturing some people's imagination and, and attention. Yeah, so there's a question in the chat about invasives, about, about, invasive, about invasive species and invasive plants. And I always get very uncomfortable about invasive plants and invasive species because to be quite honest, everything in Britain is invasive because it was all under an ice sheet during the Pleistocene and so therefore everything that's here. But so what, what's the, so we have a very, there's this very visceral thing about invasive species. So in India, Gitanjali and Padma, what's the feeling about invasive species or do people, is there that xenophobia? I always call it plant xenophobia. <laughs> <But>. <laughs> Gitanjali, you should talk about uh, the ficus. 
our most yeah. the the people tree our our most um, sacred plant but it's an invasive it, isn't it gidanjali it's classified yeah it's actually there's a question of the chat asking me where i expect where i least expected to see plants well we grown up i mean we know that the people tree is um, one of the most sacred trees in india but um you see it grow i've been seeing it growing in little crevices you know in streets and in sort of in between bricks and walls popping out of the most unusual spaces in drains and then i looked it up to see whether um you know why i'm seeing it in all these unusual uh, spaces uh, after seeing it you know photographing it in temples for so many years and uh, it it's been classified as an invasive weed which is uh, you know uh, you put the image of the priest praying to it and my feet you know stamping on it near a drain it's complete cognitive dissonance when i put the two images together so uh, yeah, yeah yeah but in i think here with, yeah, with invasive weeds like the lantana there's the water hyacinth in bangalore right but people are finding ways to we you know to to use it for the make furniture out of it and um, all kinds of stuff is happening many experiments with weeds so a way of, a way of of integrating it into culture rather than just integration as opposed to eradication yeah yeah that's that's actually very yeah, nice but yeah. but also that lack of eradication has come because of lantana and it is now so pervasive that sometimes more than half of forest areas are covered with lantana so it's come out of desperation rather on how to use it rather than not knowing yeah. what to do with it yeah um okay so before we end there is an interesting question which i would like to pose to all of you one by one is david hill us could i ask each panelist which plant first really caught your imagination or sparked your interest in the plant world we'll go with twen um personally um i remember i was i must have been like 10 years of age and i had a fascination for snakes in the rainforest i don't know why i don't know where i exact, exactly got that from because my parents weren't into plants uh, whatsoever uh, they're slowly getting i slowly convincing them a bit more um but i remember um reading a book uh, by a conservationist um a swiss conservationist who was a uh, doing conservation work over in central america and he described uh, the ficus tree um and his life cycle and i had since then i had this fascination with um with epiphytic or mechanically dependent plants including uh, stranglers like fig trees which start their life cycle on top of a tree as a seedling and then send their roots down and then start constricting the whole tree almost like in a an almost like in a parasitic fashion until the whole tree dies and it becomes an independent structural tree and i think that that's what what really started fascinating me on 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 like on plants in general and kind of like their their versatility um and their adaptation and capacity i think that that's something that really stuck with me as a child selfie um well it's interesting actually because my um my kind of first relation you know with plants start with started with an insect a butterfly um so i was living you know in a, in a flat and uh, my father one day brought a caterpillar on a fennel plant and this was a swallow tail caterpillar which i didn't know at the time i thought you know all oh, this looks quite interesting and the plant looked interesting as well and i raised it in in a shoe box and we had to feed it you know with fennel obviously so i kind of got really early this relationship you know with between plants and and eat the insects and the environment in in general um so i managed to raise it successfully and it, it kind of you know <laughs> uh, flew away and that was quite exciting as you know a four year old obviously um but i think that was you know my my first kind of way of getting enthused about plants and then i started you know growing them um looking at them under a microscope um so i i was interested in you know plants in in i think in in general uh, but i have to say that you know some someone said about you know growing plants and certainly that magic of you know seeing plants grow is is something that i think is is um, is really important and i think in 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 some countries for example you know they try to have plants in all schools which potentially could be something very easy you know very easy to do but which can which can really help um, you know children connect to with, from an early age evangeli um well you know i have to see the aloe vera plant because um <laughs> yeah way be, i mean way before the lotus i started noticing the lotus on water tankers which is really what started uh, an active interest in the botanical but uh, we, we ran this project called the public pharmacy for vit vitamin advice and other things and um 
uh, you know, there was, it was this, uh, we were teaching students about plants and their, their therapeutic values and so on and so forth. And then uh, one student just decided to do aloe vera shots in the class, you know, as part of the project. And I'm thinking, you know, I mean, this, this plant has really got something in it because, and then sort of, it sort of went on to other things. But uh, that's when I started looking at the plant really differently to see, you know, what are the, there are many possibilities that one can explore with it. But that was the plant that sort of kicked it off for me. Don? Um, mine's a, a really common, uh, a common uh, seed that people grow um, often as a child. And uh, I started gardening when I was three and my mum gave me a packet of nasturtium seeds. And, and I was just thinking as I, as I was waiting to, you know, be, be the story of, of your, your most important favorite plant. And I could feel that seed between my think, finger and thumb. And there's something about nasturtium seeds. They, they have a very irregular surface and it's when you pick them out of the packet and you get them between your, your fingers and you make the hole and then you put them in. Um, that memory stayed on my fingers for, well, I mean, a long, long time, decades. And the other thing that happened was my dad, he cut hedges, but he wasn't really the gardener. My mum was the gardener and he weeded my nasturtium patch. And I, I didn't realise, but my mum said I had a complete emotional breakdown about it and was totally distraught. <laughs> um, so for me, that that is interesting that I have this sensory, mm. this sensory memory of the plant and the gardening of it, but also this deep emotional reaction to them being removed just at the point of flowering by someone I loved very much. So we talked about complexity in our relationships. That for me epitomizes that, that complexity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We can't let you go, Sandy. We have, well, no, I have to ask you the okay, question. I'll tell, I'll tell you mine is, is I was never, I was never, I mean, I grew up in the mountains and, and plants were all around. You know, we would go and play in the canyons and plants were everywhere. But I, so I never really thought about it that much, I suppose. Um, and when I went to university, I wasn't going to do botany at all. I, but I couldn't get into a marine biology class because I grew up in a landlocked part of the United States and I couldn't get into marine biology. I'd wanted to go to the beach. And I took a class in botany and we went out to the desert with microscopes and looked at plants with microscopes in the outdoors. And it was, it was a complete revelation and I never ever looked back. Mm. Thank you. It wasn't a plant in particular. I mean, I can think of one. I can remember looking at one and thinking it was outstanding. It was grasses for a start, which are amazing. Grasses are amazing. But also something called crossostoma, which is a strange plant from Southern California. Right. What about you, Padma? No. Good <laughs> question. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> um, mine's very easy and very simple. It's going to sound dumb, but it's a daisy oh. I can't I it's just it just gets me every time I know there are places around my house where it's just full of daisies now but I just cannot resist diving to the ground and taking a picture I have must have thousands of pictures of daisies on my phone you know when you ask kids to draw a flower they possibly draw a daisy um and I haven't grown up it's still that uh, that's a really good one. My composite friend would have loved that. <laughs> well, I just this like is, to thank everyone yeah. for coming and for and for being here and all of you panelists for being here and Padma for organizing because this has been a wonderful evening and it's been a real exploration and has opened my mind to a lot of things about the intersection between plants and arts and humans and feelings. So thank you so much for organizing it, Padma, and thanks you guys for coming and thanks to all of our audience for, for staying as well and i hope everyone enjoyed it <laughs> okay thank bye everyone much. thank, thank you, you very much take care bye, bye. see ya